Hello everyone, welcome to The Net Online. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We're gonna kick things off as we always do with a short video clip that will correspond with our message today. Be sure to like and subscribe so we can give you future alerts for when we post messages and drop a comment below and thank you guys so much for joining us. Ready field. Command confirmed. Please have a seat. What is that? Microscopic robots, designed to wipe out artificial synapses. Nanites? Yes. A safeguard should a positronic brain malfunction. Like mine? Yes, Sonny, like yours. They look like me, but none of them are me. Isn't that right, Doctor? Yes, Sonny, that's right. You are unique. Will it hurt? If you've ever seen that movie, that's pretty good. iRobot. She's putting down the rogue robot. But she doesn't. So, anyway. Oh, is that a spoiler? Oh, man. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I'm glad y'all love me. All right. <clears throat> I love you, so, okay. Let's, uh, let's pray as we go on the Word this morning. Father, we, uh, we thank you for your presence. We could sense you here among us. We, we embrace your presence. We embrace the word of truth today. We're open. We're teachable. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so, you know, we're in a series. It's called Dumb Things People Do to Mess Up Their Lives and Why Following God's Ways Makes Sense. So the subtitle today is The Value of Life. And in case you haven't figured it out, we're essentially going through the Ten Commandments, right? So each week I told you I would tell you some dumb thing that I've done in my life. So this particular dumb thing, <clears throat> and, and I wasn't going to just give you childhood stuff, right? So I gave you one last week, made myself very vulnerable, gave in a more of a grown-up dumb thing, okay? So tonight is a kind of grown-up. I was probably about 19, and I did this because my boss told me to. So what he asked me to do was really dumb. <laughs> so uh, the next screen kind of illustrates it. So if, as you notice from these pictures, pontoon boats do fall off of trailers. And so I worked for a boat marina in northern Arkansas on the lakes, the Twin Lakes up there in the summers. And... Uh, and so I was, yeah, probably 19 when this happened. So my boss tells me, he says, so we're going to be bringing a new, a brand new, I mean, brand new. I mean, they just assembled it, pontoon boat from a property. We had to bring it all the way around the loop and onto the other side toward the lake. And it was quite a, I mean, pretty far, maybe 10 miles, maybe 15 miles. So the pontoon boat is on the trailer. And he says, but what we need you to do is we need you to ride on top of it <laughs> to help hold it down. What do you think I did? I'm like, man, this is like a Marvel moment. I'm like on top of the pontoon boat, riding above everything, you know, like Superman flying above every. You know, I'm on top and I'm holding on to a strap or rope or something and, and going with this pontoon boat. But when you look back on it, it was pretty dumb. Maybe they should have used some other method of anchoring it. 
like maybe bungee cords or something. Maybe they hadn't invented them yet. I don't know. It would have taken a pretty big bungee cord to hold it, but, but that's what they didn't want to happen, and so they wanted me to prevent it. And I was scrawny. I didn't weigh much. I mean, I probably weighed 150 pounds. Like, that's going to really matter as far as how we're going to hold down this pontoon boat. Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to really anchor it down, you know. <laughs> you know, like ready to blow away in the wind. All right, so anyway, there it is. Dumb thing. So I'm going to review today by using a notable thought. Some of you that are visiting or new, notable thoughts, just a way that I can kind of put into a, key, a cohesive statement uh, uh, my thoughts. Okay. So we have been looking at the biblical moral framework for intelligent living. When we go against God's moral law, we undermine our own best interests, grieve the Holy Spirit, and violate our conscience. Since his laws are reflections of his design, we are remiss to ignore them. I actually wrote that out like years ago, but it still works. I almost need to read it again. There's so much loaded in that single statement. So the Ten Commandments is a moral framework. The ancient boundaries that God has set in place. But as the statement reflects, these statements, these Ten Commandments reflect on God's design. They're descriptions of reality. And when we go against that, it's self-destructive. <clears throat> so, commandment number six is where we are today. You shall not murder. It's one verse, that's it. That's the whole Bible verse. Exodus 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. And when you look at that, you think, okay, so you're going to teach us this today like we're a bunch of murderers. You don't know. No, not at all. That's not it at all. But, but we may be more complicit in murder than we may think we are. And so as we go through this, I want us to just kind of grasp a context of how we have facilitated a culture of murder, not just in the United States, but around the world. So it may seem re irrelevant to us on a day-to-day -day basis on face value, but in fact it isn't. Jesus addressed this commandment in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 22. He says, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, or empty-headed good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So we need to be careful what we say and what we say about each other. But Jesus is not negating the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. What he's actually doing is underscoring it. And he's going to the heart. He's going to, in fact, he always goes to the heart. What are the motives? What are, what are the things inside us that trigger that murdering spirit or jealous spirit or whatever it happens to be? And so he's raising the bar concerning this commandment. So as we go forward, I want to, there's a lot of, I believe, misunderstandings about this commandment, you shall not murder. People in the military, Christians that are in the police force, oftentimes can become conflicted trying to understand at what point am I authorized or can I even still please God if I actually were to kill somebody in self-defense, this kind of thing. <clears throat> so what I want to do is play two clips. These will be back to back. Two video clips from two different movies. The first movie is High Noon. I believe it was made in maybe 19... A 1960s, early 60s, it's a pretty old movie, uh, but it's a fabulous movie. Um, and the second movie is more modern, but still a little aged, maybe 15 years old, called From the Unit. Um, kind of a special forces group that, that were carrying out missions. 
So we'll play the first one from High Noon. It's obvious it's black and white. It'll be, it's an old clip. But notice how they deal with this commandment and contrasting each one. And then we'll talk about it. Everybody quiet. Keep it orderly. You had your hand up, Ezra. I can't believe I've heard some of the things that have been said here. You all ought to be ashamed of yourselves. Sure, we paid this man and he was the best marshal this town ever had. And it ain't his trouble, it's ours. I tell you, if we don't do what's right, we're gonna have plenty more trouble. So there ain't but one thing to do now, and you all know what that is. Go ahead, Gibby. This whole thing's been handled wrong. Here's those three killers walking the streets bold as brass. Why didn't you arrest them, Marshal? Why didn't you put them in jail where they ought to be? Then we'd only have Miller to worry about instead of the four of them. I haven't anything to arrest them for, Mr. Trumbull. They haven't done anything. There's no law against them sitting on a bench at the depot. I can't listen to any more of this. What's the matter with you people? Don't you remember when a decent woman couldn't walk down the street in broad daylight? Don't you remember when this wasn't a fit place to bring up a child? How can you sit here and talk and talk and talk like this? What are we all getting so excited about? How do we know Miller's on that train anyway? Oh, we can be pretty sure he's on it. Time's getting short. Parson, you got anything to say? I don't know. The commandments say, thou shalt not kill, but we hire men to go out and do it for us. The right and the wrong seem pretty clear here. But if you're asking me to tell my people to go out and kill, and maybe get themselves killed, I'm sorry. I don't know what to say. I'm sorry. Chaplain, what I want... The taking of life. When is it justified? You mean you? But when are you justified? Yes, that's exactly what I mean. When is it right? The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. Now, I used to be here on the teams, you know, back in the 90s, before I got out and went to the seminary. Yeah, I'd heard that rumor. It's true. Well, look, the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. No, it says, thou shalt not murder. Is that a small point? I... Ever... It says, thou shalt not murder. Okay, the two words in Hebrew are quite distinct, and so the use is quite intentional. Murder is the unnecessary and immoral taking of life. Well, is the taking of life ever necessary? You know that it is. Uh, would you ever kill an intruder who came to your home in the middle of the night to harm your family? Would you? Some say that the taking of life is never justified. Those people, soldier, employ others to protect them so that they will never have to face that choice. Do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. You understand? I understand. But? <laughs> but? That's right. Okay, let me tell you this one thing. Oh, I know. God loves me. Yes, God loves you. Okay, and I know you're hurting, but I'd like you to leave with this. When there is no more information, it's time to make a decision. We all have our limits. Maybe you've had enough. God bless you. Okay, so, so the first clip is almost embarrassing because the pastor, finally, in, in, the, in the plot of the movie, the sheriff is trying to find support because these thugs are coming in town for vengeance. And so he goes to all the different communities to say, hey, I need your help at noon today. There's going to be a showdown, right? And so he goes to his best friends. He goes to people who used to be deputized. In every case, they'd, they'd turn him down or they'd shrug him off or they would. And then he would go, he went to the bar. Certainly in an old Western, you can find some support from the bar. And so the one person that said they would help him was a guy that was hopelessly alcoholic drunkard. And he's like, no, no, I'm not going to. He wouldn't use him. So he finally, as his last resort, he thinks, I'll go. It's on Sunday morning. They're having church. And he goes to the church and says, so I need your help. I don't ask for much. And that was the debate that kind of went on in the church. And what's fascinating is that in both cases, they misunderstand the scripture and translate it, thou shalt not kill instead of thou shalt not murder. And that's commonly thrown around. 
that people just think, well, yeah, the commandment is thou shalt not kill, but it actually isn't. And the second clip really did a good job explaining that. You would almost think that was a Christian television program. But the unit is not a Christian program by any means. But yet in that clip, they had some really good kind of common sense advice for someone who's in the military in a case like that. So, yeah, so the parson in the end, he finally goes to the church and he asks the leader of the church, the man of God, the man of the word, what is your position? He says, well, right and wrong seems clear here, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to take a stand. I'm not going to take a position. After all, the Bible does say you shall not kill. And I'm like, that is so lame. Okay, so it's embarrassing it's so lame. I'm embarrassed for the film, but it's one of my favorite films ever, so just for the record. And I'm not going to give you any spoilers on that one. <laughs> like you're going to go watch it. Who said thank you? <laughs> yeah, okay. Are you going to go watch it? High noon? You might. Okay. It's a... All right. Okay, so, so point is with the contrast and clips is there is a lot of modern day confusion. Some people think that killing and eating animals is murder, for instance. Okay, biblically, is it murder to eat or to kill an animal? Um, I think I have a picture of some monkeys. So there's a well-organized movement that gorillas, apes, and chimpanzees should be com com included in a community of equals with human beings. Okay, so the next time the chimp comes along and steals your picnic basket off your table, are you going to prosecute him? Are you going to take him to court? Can you put a lie detector on him? Well, they can't talk anyway, so that's not going to work. So the idea of human rights for apes, after all, they're being held in detention centers unlawfully called zoos. I, I know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious, but there really is a serious movement that has bought in and believes some of these things. Many believe that capital, in other words, they create a moral equivalency. And it's often a common argument that people use. Well, that's bad, but this is bad too, so therefore it's all bad. Um, many believe that capital punishment, for instance, is a violation of the Sixth Commandment. While believing that at the same people that would be against, oftentimes, often, against the, the uh, capital punishment, execution of a criminal, the very same people would also say that it's okay to kill unborn children. So it's interesting how the same people will take the flip side. Once in a while, you'll see a pro-lifer who doesn't believe in capital punishment. That's, that's not necessarily an incongruity, but it, not that it doesn't happen. But by and large, generally speaking, people who are against capital punishment are for killing babies. What's the difference? Is it the same thing? Is this another moral equivalency? Regardless of what you may personally struggle with concerning capital punishment, I do want to make an observation, and that is to say this. They are not a moral equivalency. And an unborn baby is innocent in the purest form of the word. There is no human being more innocent and more helpless and cannot speak for itself than an unborn child. Someone who is in prison, who may be guilty of multiple rapes, perhaps multiple murders, may be essentially a monster. This is not, they are in fact a victimizer, whereas the other, the unborn baby, is a victim. And they're not in the same, this is not apples and apples, this is apples and oranges. They're completely different, it's a different, plat uh, a different platform of argument that needs to be made on each, each terms, but not an argument of moral equivalency. So Leviticus actually addresses this in at least a small sense to show that there is no moral equivalence. If you look at Leviticus chapter 24, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 21 to 22, it says, Thus the one who kills an animal shall make it good, but the one who kills a man shall be put to death. So the Bible does not create any kind of equivalency 
There shall be one standard for you, and it shall be for the stranger as well as the native, for I am the Lord your God. Meaning this is an across-the-board rule. It's life for life. What, what, is he, what is he saying? And, you know, a lot of times people think, well, gosh, that just, you know, you're killing a human being. And the Bible's advocating capital punishment here. You have to understand what the Bible is saying is that if you steal, you steal a human life, you take them before their time. Perhaps they have family members, perhaps they have relationships, perhaps... You know, every one of us represent an investment in our personal life, all that's been deposited in us, all of our life experiences, all that we are investing in other people. If, if somebody kills somebody, takes their life, they're stealing not only that person's life, but they're stealing them from among the community they're a part of. And so what Jesus, I mean, I'm sorry, what the scripture is actually teaching here is that a human life, is so high in value, intrinsically high in value. A single human life is so valuable, so precious, so valuable, the only corresponding appropriate penalty from a justice standpoint is life for life. Anything less means that we think that somehow the human life they took, the one who is victimized, is on equal terms with the person that's a victimizer. So you have to remember what the Bible's actually saying is that human life is of great, very high intrinsic value. And so therefore the penalty for taking a human life, murdering a person, must be also the highest price possible to pay. So Jesus used expressions like this in the New Testament. He'd say, how much more value are you than sparrows or sheep or whatever it happens to be? He would use this contrast. How much more valuable are you as a human being? In fact, we are so valuable that he was willing to come. God became a man, came to earth, and paid the highest price for us in our behalf because he saw that we had intrinsic value. Even in our sinful, rebellious state, he still comes to rescue us. So biblical justice is this. The crime must be equal to the punishment. It needs to be proportional. This is one of the things that in the justice system is much debate. Is that a proportional penalty? Is that an appropriate penalty? Is that a just penalty for that particular crime or, or whatever was done? And so a human being is irreplaceable. And the idea in Leviticus is that an animal is replaceable. You follow? But a human being is not replaceable. Some people believe in pacifism. That is, among some Christians, that any form of killing, even a police officer carrying out his duty, would be somehow intrinsically sinful or wrong, morally wrong. What we need to understand looking at the Bible, and you look at the Old Testament especially, many of our modern Western laws originally were built very much so after the Old Testament laws. So the Bible actually distinguishes between murder, manslaughter, self-defense, combat, accidental deaths, and capital punishment. It, in other words, these are all different categories and are all dealt with differently. You follow? It's very important to understand, but the fact is the Bible is not a pacifistic book by any means. I do a whole message called, Was Jesus a Pacifist? And... Um, there's a very strong case, uh, a traditional mainstream case that really is made uh, among evangelical leaders that uh, Jesus was not a pacifist and pacifism is not a New Testament teaching or an Old Testament teaching. I don't really have time to go into that a lot right now. But most people, if you were to do like in the second clip, if you were to corner them, and I've done this with some pacifist friends in the past, I'll say so. They say you're married. You have children in the house and you have an intruder come in the house and you have the means to defend yourself and it might mean using lethal force. Would you do it to protect your family? In most cases, people will budge right there. Like, well, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just trust God or, you know, some stupid thing. No, trusting God is never stupid. 
But what I'm saying, to be passive when it's on you, it's, in, it's, it's on you to defend your family. It's on you. And you do whatever means necessary to protect those who God has trusted you to protect. It seems that the wanton killing of innocent human beings is rampant on the earth today. I remember when ISIS was on a rampage throughout the Middle East. They were targeting Jews, but they were also targeting Christians. And they had the most gruesome tortures and the most gruesome methods of extracting confessions and things out of them. I, I mean, it's hard. I mean, I can't even describe the types of things they were doing to people. They're almost, they're so inhuman, so monstrous. And I remember at that time thinking, we need to do whatever we can to stop them. And actually, we did. In conjunction with our allies, we really, to some extent, kind of eradicated ISIS. The problem is that they morph into other groups. And so what we have today is Hamas and Hezbollah. And they are the new ISIS. They are just as cruel, just as murderous, just as barbaric as ISIS ever was. And I would, I would bet you anything that many of the same exact people are a part of these groups as were a part of ISIS. And most of it fueled by, by Iran. So you look at these people and you look at the brutal murders, you look at what happened in Israel recently where they, they came in and just literally murdered 1,400 people and now they have, what, 230 people that are hostages. But don't think for a minute that these groups, diabolically evil as they are, don't think for a minute that while they're going after Jews, that somehow that means that we're exempt. Uh, oh, and by the way, Israel had a disarmament policy where they had everybody stripped of personal firearms and this kind of thing. And I remember when I was in Israel, but that all changed the day that happened. Everybody got a gun. Everybody got an AR. Everybody got handguns. Everybody armed up. And the government said, arm up. We can never be in a place again where we can't defend ourselves, where we cannot defend our families. Self-defense is a fundamental human right. Jesus believed in it too. He used it in one of his parables. It wasn't the point of the parable, but it was a sub-point, if you will. Remember he talked about the thief comes in. If you knew what time he was coming in, you would be ready for him. You'd prevent him. Remember that? So the whole premise of that was, if you knew what time he was coming, you'd be ready to defend your home. But Jesus assumed that everyone understood that that was an element of self-defense, that you have every right to do that. So, these people hate you and I as much as they, maybe not quite as much as the Jews, but almost. So that spirit of hate, that spirit of deception, that diabolical evil that's fomenting in their hearts, the deception that they live in, if it has an opportunity to spew itself out on us, it will. How many of them have snuck in with the millions of people they're letting in over the border with no documentation? So, we need to understand that there is unleashed in the earth today a real evil. I totally, absolutely stand with Israel's right to defend itself and to do whatever they need to do to eradicate these groups. You know that we have forces within that aren't Islamic. And obviously not every Islam, Islamic person, but we're talking about the radical Islamic fascist. And there are a lot of them. But there are forces within our own kind of extremes within America. We have a speaker, a new house speaker in the United States named Mike Johnson. Have you all followed it? I mean, I was disappointed when they get Jim Jordan in there, and I kind of liked him. But, but in the end, they had a, the Republicans had a unanimous vote to vote this guy Mike Johnson in. And I looked at that, and I went, who is Mike Johnson? Did y'all do that too? Like, who is that? It turns out, you know who Mike Johnson is? 
He is a born-again, spirit-filled, on fire, loves God, builds his life on the Word of God, and they voted unanimously to bring Mike Johnson into the House. I'm like, and you know now the liberal wackos on the edge and the fringe and the, in their own media fringes, you know what they're saying about Mike Johnson? Because I'll guarantee you if they're saying it about him, they're saying it about you. Because if, you're a, if you believe in the Bible and you build your worldview on the Scriptures, and you, so you need to understand that there are elements in America that are full of venom and they are very hostile towards Christian, Christians in general. But it's kept at bay. It's kept in check. Because there's so many of us. We're a little hard to manage. So here's what they're saying. I'm not going to even name the news sources. I could go on and on with this. They've been referred, he has been referred to as a Christo-fascist. What in the world is a Christo-fascist? Isn't that an oxymoron? Christo-fascist. Equivalent to the Taliban. I think this was, uh, what's his name? Uh, the talk show guy that's so crazy. Uh, well, yeah, there's a lot of them. Anyway, he said that Mike Johnson is, has his faith is comparable to a mass murderer. Well, you know what they're saying, so is your faith. Because he's of the same flavor as us. He is our brother in the Lord. And I'm just thankful that somehow, by a miracle of God, we put somebody into that very influential position that seems to be have conviction that he can't be bought, and he just fears God. And he's going to live that way, and he's not ashamed of it. And so, oh, here's another one. Somebody else said he is a bigger threat than Hamas. This is all matter of public record, ladies and gentlemen. And what I'm trying to help you understand is that there are forces, currents, and don't think necessarily we're as safe as you may think we are in the United States. The potential for harm exists. And the other thing, this is for free, what I've been noticing lately is the alignment between the Islamic fascists and Marxist. Look at the alignments nationally, the sides, how they're aligning, who's supporting who, and this kind of thing. And so what you see is that the Marxists are fueling and supplying the Islamic fascists. And so you have these demarcations around the world. I thought, it, I thought it years ago, I, I thought there's got to be a link between the BLM, the Antifa protesters. This is for free too, it's not in my notes. But I used to look at how they dressed and how they behave and how, how much they seem to advocate anarchy in some of the cities and the way they're burning down all these buildings and just these awful, and why in the world we don't prosecute any of these people, I cannot fathom. But they get a free pass somehow. Why? Because they're Marxists. And we have a lot of Marxists in charge of our government right now. So, I always wondered, I thought there must be a link between the Antifa, black dressed up people, and the Islamic fascists. There's got to be a link. And more and more you're seeing there actually is a link. So that's for free. I think Charlie Kirk was bringing out the link the other day. So here's what I want us to understand as we go into this a little bit deeper. Self-defense is not murder. The role of civil government to bring about just and fair laws is still upheld in the New Testament. You see Romans 13. I'll just read uh, the first uh, three and four, verses three and four. This this passage really is, is marking out the role, the godly role of civil government, what it should be doing. And it says, for rulers, in other words, rulers should not be a cause. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior. At least they should not be. You see, you understand he's projecting out this is the way it ought to be, this is the way it should be. They should not be a cause or are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. 
Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God to you. So that means the civil authorities, the ministry, the, the, uh, the police officers, the next guy that pulls you over and wants to give you a ticket and all that. The scripture is saying they are a minister of God. To you, they're serving, they're, they're a minister of God to you. In other words, they're serving you also, essentially, for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it, it, the, the government, it's not referring to that particular officer. It's talking about the, the role, the position. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, a servant of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the, the one who practices evil. So they actually are representing a taste of ultimate wrath. They're representing God. And when we do wrong, there are consequences for that. So this minister of God, and you could extend this to whether it's police officers or whether it's soldiers or people that that we, the people, have commissioned to defend our nation, the military, so forth. It says he does not bear the sword for nothing. What he's saying is that these people are allowed lethal force when needed. And that's New Testament. There's a lot of people that don't like that. That's why they just want to read the red letters because it's too much of what Paul says they don't like, they don't agree with. I don't agree with that. Well, no, do we believe the Bible's inspired cover to cover? Absolutely. So you don't just take your scissors to the Bible and say, well, I'm just going to read the red letter parts. You know, there actually is a movement. It's not really very popular anymore, but it's the red letter, the red letter movement. Like, we just, we can't get the Old Testament, and we don't get most of the New Testament, but we get the words of Jesus. But even then, if you just go with the red letters, Jesus says a lot of really pretty tough stuff. So here's a... Uh, so when we talk about a... Thou shalt not murder. How are we potentially complicit in that? So if you vote for a candidate that believes in abortion then are you not complicit with the murder of those children? Maybe you say, well, I've, I know better now, I've learned better, but I did vote for Obama. Well, you need to repent. You need to ask God to forgive you because he was, up until Biden, he was the most pro-abortion president in the history of the United States. If you voted for him, then you have blood on your hands. You understand? So a lot of times we're, we're kind of looking at it, we're a little bit high and mighty. Well, you know, I, I would never murder somebody. I would never do. I don't even know if I'd commit self-defense. I don't even know if I would do that. Yeah, I just know. I just don't even believe in guns. and I'm not going to have knives or anything. But I will vote for Obama. See? You realize, you realize that there are states in the union right now that believe that abortion should be legal up until the birth canal. Can y'all name? There's at least three states. California. California's not one of them, but they're bad. They're really bad. Oregon, I think, is one of them. Alaska. And I'm like, what is wrong with those people in Alaska? <laughs> yeah, right, right. But the point is, is that, is that there need to be Boundaries, there need to be restrictions. We need to protect these unborn babies and to think that a state is not only some of these states, once the Supreme Court lifted the restrictions on states, once that happened, many of them went nuts and they, they went the opposite direction. Well, 14 states here pretty quick, 15 states, had pretty much banned abortion in their states entirely. And then you have another six or seven states that want to ban abortion for all practical purposes if they have heartbeat bill or something like that, essentially it's an abortion ban. And so there'll be close to half of all the states that were restricted, but then you have these crazy crazies on the other end of it that are like, oh yeah, we'll be, I think, was it maybe New Mexico? Somebody will Google it, you can tell me later, but I know there's at least three states 
that are saying we want abortion legal all the way. That baby can be ready to be born, but you can kill it legally in our state. Is that not murder? Of course it's murder. If that's not murder, then what is murder? Then murder doesn't exist if that's not murder. The brutal killing, brutal killing of an unborn child. It can't defend itself. Because why? So, yeah, so when we say, well, I don't know how this is relevant to me, then we have to do a little soul searching and realize to what degree are we complicit. Well, as you say, well, I don't know if I want to get involved in politics and I don't know if I believe in a political solution. Well, do you know why Texas banned abortion? Because we've been involved in politics. Because we elected pro-life representatives in the House and Senate of Texas and a pro-life governor and lieutenant governor and attorney general. And they're all pro-life majorities, okay? And so they, they represent we the people of Texas and they banned abortion in Texas. And I'm really happy about that, but that is saving lives every single day. It has put a lid on murder open season on unborn babies in this state. And that we should be happy, we should rejoice over that. This is a huge, big victory. Florida is this close to doing the same thing. It's just held up in the courts. So two of the largest states in the union are about to have abortion bans. So this is a what if question, a kind of what would you do a professor in a world-acclaimed medical school once posed this medical situation, an ethical problem to the students. Here is the family history. The father has syphilis. The mother has TB. They've already had four children. The first is blind. The second had died. The third is deaf. And the fourth has TB. Now the mother is pregnant again. The parents come to you for advice. They're willing to have an abortion. If you decide they should, what do you say? The students gave various individual opinions, and then the professor asked them to break into small groups for consultation. All of the groups came back to report that they would recommend abortion. And then the professor says, congratulations. You just took the life of Beethoven. And this is where we have to understand that, that even sometimes people have limitations or imperfections or maybe a disability. But the fact is that every single life is valuable. Every single human life is intrinsically valuable and deserves to be protected. In our history, one of the sad chapters of our history was the legal, legalization of slavery. We went to a bloody civil war. It was incomprehensible how bloody and costly the civil war was in the United States. But slavery was outlawed. But the mindset, especially in the South, in the states that advocated for slavery, their mindset was that black people are not quite human. Somehow they are subhuman, and so therefore we can treat them more like we would an animal. Well, the Christians, I mean, I'm talking about the Christians, especially the Christians in the North. There are a number of groups of Christians that were very much against slavery. In fact, the abolition of slavery was a profoundly Christian movement, by the way. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. It was Christians who stood the line. They stood on the line for 50 years fighting for the emancipation of the slaves. And they had made tremendous progress, by the way, before the Civil War. But the idea is if we can take a swath of human beings and put over them non-human, not worthy to live, as we have done with unborn babies in many states today. So you put a big swath over this child and say not worthy to be lived. We can dispense if we choose. The Jews in the Holocaust 
The Nazi mindset was that they were vermin, they were animals, and they should be pursued, and they should be executed, they should be uh, quarantined and identified and put in concentration, concentration camps and massively killed. Many people don't know this. We all know how many Jews were killed in World War II by the Nazis? Six million. Six million, thank you. But how many people did Hitler actually kill in those camps? 12 million. So who are the other 6 million people? See, we always think, well, it was the 6 million Jews because the Nazis said they're subhuman. We can do with them whatever we want. But a lot of the other 6 million could be the disabled, could be homosexuals, could be gypsies. But you know who a lot of them were? They were Christians who were protesting. They were Christians who were objecting. And I will guarantee you millions of the Christians who had solidarity with their Jews, Jewish friends, they were also taken down. So somewhere in there, you've got another six million people that were also taken out and executed. So once you can take a swath of people and put non-human on them, then it gives you permission to dispense of them however you please. And this is the mindset of ISIS. This is the mindset of Hezbollah and Hamas when it comes to Jews and Christians. I say Jews and Christians. I have a picture of unborn babies here. It's a really beautiful picture. Um, I, uh, a few years ago when Beto was running for office, there were some supporters on campus, and I thought, I want to have a conversation with these guys. And so, and so I started asking them questions like, so are you supportive of abortion? Yes, yes, yes. I said, so, so Beto supports abortion, right? So that's probably partly why you support it. Yes, yes, yes. So I just kept asking questions and kind of putting it to them. And so, so I said, so you know that Beto's position is to be able to kill a baby all the way up to birth. Did you know that? Yeah but, yeah, but it's okay. They kind of seem to know that, but I don't know if they really knew that. And I said, so, so when is it okay to kill a baby? And they kind of struggled with that question. I said, at what point? In other words, is it okay? Is it 10 weeks? Is it 12 weeks? Is it 14, 15, 20 weeks? At what point, in your opinion, is it okay to kill a baby? And on what basis do you draw that conclusion? And that's the kind of conversation. They were willing to have it for a little bit. And then at some point, I, was, I guess I was getting too close to home, and I was very, I was, I was very uh, casual with them. I was trying not to lean into them. You know what I mean? In other words, I was really trying to just have a dialogue, have a real conversation with them. And then eventually, they, once I started kind of getting real, those tender spots there where they knew they really had no case, they were like, well, you have to leave now. We, we can't get our literature out with you distracting us like this. I'm like, good. <laughs> How do you sleep at night? <laughs> you know. So basically, I think an unborn baby is not human until birth. And there's some people who believe it's not even human right after birth. And then you come with the idea of the infirm or the handicapped or the mentally disabled. And all the way down the line, there comes to be a point where maybe they're not quite human either. But we have to understand that we are made in the image of God. And every human being, whether we're short, tall, fat, skinny, doesn't matter. We all intrinsically have value in the eyes of God. Are we becoming a society that decides for others when their lives are no longer worthy of living? So I have a, a quote from Francis Schaeffer. He was a Christian philosopher back in the 70s. He said this in 1978 approximately. He says, Will a society which has assumed the right to kill infants in the womb because they are unwanted, imperfect, or merely inconvenient, have difficulty in assuming the right to kill other human beings, especially older adults who are judged unwanted, deemed imperfect physically or mentally, or considered a possible social nuisance. 
The next candidates for arbitrary reclassification as non-persons are the elderly. All right, that's what I had. If you could stand with me. I know it's kind of a heavy topic, but necessary. Mm. If we could just take a moment. I'm just going to pray. Just pray with me. If you've ever, if you've ever assisted someone Maybe you had a friend that was going to get an abortion and you were just, you didn't plead for the life of the baby, you didn't stand up, you didn't say anything, or you, even worse, perhaps even drove them to the abortion clinic or assisted them in some way. Then I want, there is grace. This is the most amazing thing about our message. Perhaps there's someone here who's actually had an abortion. And I, and I want to just really urge you to understand that God extends grace towards you. That when we, and, and one of the problems is because of the pain and, that surrounds this, we don't want to necessarily admit it. Yes, I was complicit. I was in violation of the sixth commandment. But that's also where you find your freedom. Jesus came to save sinners, not the righteous. And so when we can come to a place of honesty and admit, yes, I did, I did this, or I did that, and we can say that honestly before God, it's then that he extends. He came to save us sinners. He came to save us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. So, but, but as long as we have minimized and explained it away and said it's not relevant, even, even something as simple as voting for a radical pro-abortion candidate, in, in a way, all these things are framed in with a need for mercy, for the need for grace, and repentance, right? So God, I just pray right now for everyone in this room that if there's been compromise regarding the sixth commandment, Thou shalt not murder. We ask you to cleanse us. We ask you to wash us. We ask you to forgive us where, where anyone in this room has, has crossed lines and now they look back and they realize, I really regret that. And God, we just thank you that your mercy extends even, even to this. So God, we just invite your grace to come. We invite your mercy to come. We invite your cleansing to come. And Lord, I pray for release on any, any human being in this room right now, any, men, any of our men or women in this room right now that in some way have a realization of guilt. And God, I pray right now that as we repent and we come before you honestly, that we will experience your grace. There's not a single person in this room who is not desperate for your grace. Come Holy Spirit, Cause cleansing and release from guilt and shame to come. We need you, Father. We call upon you, Lord. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you paid the price for our cleansing and our forgiveness. Wash us clean and we're clean, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Um, April, is there a song that kind of comes to mind while we're singing? I mean, while, while I'm closing? Huh? Let's just take a minute, worship. Um, not in a hurry. Uh, just uh, as I was praying that prayer, especially if perhaps there was something in you really resonating that, yes, I need, I need some closure, I need some cleansing, I need some washing. 
um, while we worship right now, just take a moment and just present it all to him. If you don't know the Lord, if you haven't been born again, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot see his kingdom. Uh, if there's someone here not born again, please don't walk out of here the same as you came in. I just really, is there, is there someone here this morning who say, I, I don't believe, I'm not sure. I, I don't think I'm born again. I, I need to get right with God. Is there someone here this morning who would just say, yes, that's me. And I, I would love to talk with you. Just slip your hand up if you could real quick. I'll walk you through it. It's not that hard. The only thing that's hard is our stubbornness. Jesus. I didn't see any hands. But sometimes I miss them. So I'm looking and scanning. You know. Lord, we just commit this day to you. We just thank you for this time and your word and instruction. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys.